many are ready for heaven? Yep, yep, can't wait. Well, you better be ready because it's right around the corner. Yes, sir. And it could happen uh, at any moment. Amen. Uh, turn to Revelation 21. We're going to be talking a little bit about heaven tonight. Amen. I hope you have your Bible because we're going to be doing a little bit of a Bible study this evening. And we'll be looking at a new heaven and a new earth. A new heaven and a new earth. Amen. Now, I have got to... I've got to do a little bit of groundwork by way of introduction, and uh, and so you just uh, you just stick with me. Um, but we will we will finally get to Revelation 21. I want to read the uh, I want to read the verse uh, verse number one, and then I'd like to pray for the message, and then we will get after it. But Revelation 21, if you're there, say Amen. amen. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And there was no more sea. There's a lot packed into this chapter and I'm excited about unfolding it. And looking at it, because this is our blessed hope. This is, this is why Christians shouldn't act the same way as lost people act. Uh, people that have no hope. We have all the hope in the world. Yeah. Do you truly believe that this is going to happen? Amen. I do. And, uh, and so we're going we're gonna to look at what this means to all of us this evening, all right? But before we do that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. I'm going to ask... Uh, uh, Brother Colton, would you stand and, and pray for me tonight? Dear Lord, we love you, and God, we're so thankful for another opportunity, Lord, to lift your name, to worship you, and God, we're thankful for this time that we have this book in our hands. Yes. God, we trust, faith, believe that this is your word. And Father, I believe that these are the words you have us here tonight, and God asks to prepare our hearts, prepare our minds. Father, I'm thankful for this passage of Scripture myself. I'm looking Yes. Now, this is a new heaven and a new earth, which means this is not the same heaven and earth that we know of today. Right. This event in Revelation 21, in fact, is very far away in the future. There are many things that have to happen in order for us to get to Revelation 21. I'm what you call a futurist. If you are a premillennial, dispensational, pre-tribulation rapturist, then you are a futurist, which means that most of the prophetic events that we see in the book of Revelation and in, and in the Bible are still yet to be fulfilled, right? that there, there, there is something waiting for us in the future. Now, there is something that is opposite of the futurist. That is what is called a preterist. It is P-R-E-T-E-R-I-S-T. -E -E and what they believe, which is uh, most of the people in the post-millennial camp, what they believe is that most of the prophecies that we see in the book of Revelation have actually already been fulfilled. That we're living in a golden age, that Christ is ruling from his throne, and that he will return after that reign is accomplished. Now, I am going to show you why we do not believe in post-millennialism. All right? Revelation chapter 19, remember this. 
Revelation chapter 19 is the actual revelation of Christ. It is the advent of Jesus. It is, it is the second coming of Jesus Christ. That is when he comes down on a white horse and we come with him. And there is a, a sword proceeding out of his mouth. And you might say, well, why in the world are we on horses? Have you looked at the gas prices? <laughs> God knows all, amen. So, that is the revelation of Christ, but that is not to be confused with the rapture of the Gentile church, which we are a part of. So, just for a few moments, I want to get us caught up to Revelation chapter number 21. And I want to ask the congregation, what is the next event on God's prophetic timetable? It's the rapture. It is the rapture of the church. This is something that was not revealed to the Old Testament prophets. This is something, this was a mystery as 1 Corinthians 15 says. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. That is the mystery that was given to the apostle Paul and the apostle revealing what is going to take place with the Gentile church. Now, what is, what is going to happen after the tribulation? Well, look, look what it says in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4 and verse number 13 says this. You want to get your Bibles handy or you can just listen to me. The Bible says, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. And listen, listen to verse number 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. That is the rapture of the church of the living God. That is when we get our glorified bodies. That is when those who have gone on before us are reunited with their bodies. Their bodies literally come out of the grave and they're reunited with their bodies and we meet them a great reunion in the sky and we meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. That is the blessed hope. Yes, that could happen at any moment. And man, you look at the news and you see everything that's happening over in Europe and Eastern Europe and, and all of that. I'm telling you, get ready because it's going to happen and it's going to happen, hopefully, before we even get out of here this evening. But there's something else that happens before we get to Revelation 21. The tribulation. The great tribulation, which is specifically called in the Bible, the time of Jacob's trouble. It's not the time of the church's trouble or the Gentiles' trouble. It's the time of Jacob's trouble, which means it is for Israel. It is for Israel. It is the judgment and the wrath of God being poured out upon this earth. And I'm glad that I am going to be out of here before that takes place. First three and a half years, second three and a half years, 
It's just going to be the, the wrath of God being poured out on this earth. And I do not want to see it. My worst enemy, I would not want to have to face what people are going to have to face in the great tribulation. Now, that is going to take place, how many know, not necessarily right when the rapture takes place, but there is going to be a man, probably over there in Europe or in the Middle East somewhere, who's going to rise up and he's going to bring false peace to the world. And his name is the Antichrist. And he is going to sign a peace treaty over there. And at that moment, the tribulation will start. And guess what? The Antichrist is going to go back on his promise. That is going to take up seven years on this earth. Now, while that's going on, we're going to be up in glory. We're going to go to the judgment seat of Christ. And we're going to take part of the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then what's going to happen? See here, you might have to switch it for me, friend. Can you switch it for me? The second coming of Jesus Christ. And then after that, the millennial kingdom. Now, how, how long is a millennium? It's a thousand years. And then after that, the great white throne judgment. And then after that, Satan is loosed for a short season after the millennial kingdom right before the great white throne judgment and that is a thousand years where Jesus rules and reigns on this earth and we rule and reign with him and then we have revelation 21 so at best if the rapture were to take place this evening, we are at least 1,007 years away from what we see happening in Revelation chapter number 21. I'm premillennial because of this reason. I believe that the Bible specifically teaches it. That Revelation 19, Christ comes back. That Revelation chapter number 20, the millennial kingdom is established. And Revelation 21, a new heaven and a new earth. Christ comes before the millennial kingdom. And so we arrive back at Revelation chapter number 21. Look at what it says. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. Now this is what, this is what should blow all of our minds. Do you realize that God is going to get rid of the, this earth, this very earth? This earth that all the environmentalists and all the, the green people are, are, are so, I mean, it, the, the earth has basically become their God. Now, I'm not for polluting and I'm not for uh, mistreating this earth. I think that we should take care of it because God created it. But do you not realize that God is going to get rid of it? He's going to create a new heaven. And a new earth. That's why it is so silly to invest everything that we have in this temporary carnal earth and carnal world when we should be investing in eternity. And so we see a new heaven and a new earth. And we have a very specific description of what all is going to be in the new heaven and the new earth. First, I want you to see a holy city in verse number two. Look at what, what, what the Bible says. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for 
her husband. A holy city, New Jerusalem, the most beautiful sight outside of the Lord Jesus Christ that you have ever seen and God has prepared it for us and we will see the satellite city coming down from God out of heaven. Friend, it's actually going to happen. It's not a a myth. It's not a fairy tale. It's actually going to happen. Do you believe it this evening? A holy city. Secondly, we see in verse number 8 in this city, 18, look at what it says in, in 21, 18. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper. Now, how many has ever seen jasper? Now, when I think of heaven, this is what I think of. I think of the color white and I think of the color gold. All right, go to the next slide. That is actually what Jasper looks like. And I don't think that it is any accident that it is red. That anywhere that we look in this new city, we are going to be reminded of what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us on the cross of Calvary. Walls of Jasper. I mean, we're talking about a beautiful city. What else? What else is there? Pure gold. So pure that it's not actually gold, but it's crystal clear. Streets of gold. Can you imagine? Uh, Donald Trump has nothing, nothing on. Sure, he can build fantastic hotels. He can build magnificent buildings, but he has never built anything like what our Lord has built and what is prepared for us, for all eternity. Next. We see that in verse number 19, the foundations are garnished with a host of precious stones, valuable stones, expensive stones, beautiful, beautiful stones that you, 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 you can't even begin to fathom how beautiful this place is going to be. Next. We see gates of pearl. We see gates of pearl. Next. We see a pure river as crystal flowing. It's going to be awesome. Next. And we see a tree of life. Now let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. If that's all it was, would you be satisfied? I wouldn't be satisfied. And I tell you why. It's because of the next slide. That's who's going to be there. The Lamb is going to be there. The Father is going to be there. The Spirit is going to be there. The Godhead will be seen. And if that is the only thing that is there is God, then I'll be fine. But it's not just God. It's all the beauties that you can ever imagine. Heaven is going to be wonderful. I don't know much about what the current state of heaven is. We don't have many details on that. I know that the Apostle Paul said that it is far better, that it is great gain, that it is going to be wonderful, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, that if you die right now, you would go in the presence of God and you would be having the time of your life But I don't think anything compares to what the new heaven and the new earth is going to be like. Now, those are all the things that are in the new heaven and the new earth. But that's not what I want to focus on this evening. I don't want to focus on what's in the new heaven and the new earth. Although, praise the Lord, it's wonderful. I praise God for it. But the next slide, please. I want to focus on tonight, just for a few few moments, things that will not be in heaven. And if, if the things that are in heaven make us shout, just wait until we look at all the things 
that will not be in heaven. All the things that will not be in heaven. And so, forgive me, but we're going to plow through this. And uh, we're going to try to get through all of this because, let not your heart be troubled, I have 12 of them. So if you're taking notes, get ready. I'm going to plow through these uh, pretty quickly, but I'm going to go right down uh, through these three chapters and just look at all of these things that will not be in heaven so that you will be encouraged and so that you will be challenged tonight to realize that there is another city, that there is another land waiting for every Christian and it will be worth it all. It will be worth it all. So the first thing that I see that will not be in heaven is found in verse number one. Look at what it says. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more what? Sea. Now, you think to yourself, well, I love going to the beach. I love, I love uh, sticking my feet into the ocean and, and I, love, I love seeing the beauties of all of that. Well, let me just express to you for a moment what, what Spurgeon argued that this means. All right, Spurgeon argued that the sea in the Middle Eastern times carried with itself a very negative connotation. It represented many unfavorable things. At Number one, people were always being lost at sea. People were always being lost at sea. People would drown in the sea. The salt water was undrinkable and caused illness and drought. When, when it was drought and people got so desperate that they would drink the salt water, they became sick, they became ill. Opposing armies would, would come by way of ship to conquer lands by the sea. It caused separation and distance. And not to mention, what did the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ, what did he rebuke in the New Testament, in the Gospels? He rebuked the wind. He rebuked the waters. He rebuked the sea. So it represents these storms and dangers and perils. And the Bible teaches us that in this new heaven and in this new earth, there will not be any of that. There will be no more sea. And you got to think about where the author is when he is writing this book. Yes, he was, he was basically boiled alive, yes, but he was exiled to a place called the Isle of Patmos. And I don't know if you know anything about an island, but what is it surrounded by? So it causes distance, it causes isolation, it causes division. And let me just say this, when we get into the new heaven and the new earth, there will not be any division, there will not be any isolation, there will not be any distance, there will not be any peril, there will not be any danger, because there will be no more sea. And I don't know about you, But that gives me hope. There will be no more sea. You think about everything that's happening up in Russia and Ukraine right now. Do you know that the only thing that separates Ukraine from Turkey, you know what it is? It's the Black Sea. Why do you think Russia wants that thing so bad? You know that Turkey is an ally of Russia that's going to come against Israel in the end times. You you know that, right? You see that China is yoking up with Russia as we speak. That China hates our guts. That Russia hates our guts. And we're not even in prophecy. What's going to happen to us? It's separation. But in this new heaven and new earth, There's no separation. There's no division. It's all unity. It's it's all of us together, and, and not just together, but together with the Lord. A new heaven 
and the new earth. Secondly, look at what it says in verse number four. Not only is there no more sea, but look at what it says. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Can you imagine God wiping the tears from your eyes for the very last time? And nothing, nothing will enter into the world that will cause you to cry ever again. Can you imagine a place like that? That should give us hope this evening. That should give us encouragement this evening. Now, I'm not a big crier. I'm not. Uh, I cry over the silliest things, over silly movies like Toy Story 3. I should not have said that. But you know one thing that hurts worse than, than me crying is seeing other people cry. I see it all the time. When you go into the, the hospice house, you see the family gathered around and you see tears. You see your spouse that's hurting. You see, you see family members who are struggling and tears flowing. Friend, there's going to be a day when there are no more tears, that God will wipe every single tear from our eyes. That's the new heaven and new earth. Number three, I'm going to put all of these in, in the same category. Continue reading in verse number four. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. You can count on it. They are true and they are faithful. No more pain, no more sorrow. No more crying. No more fear. None of it. It's gone. Amen. Amen. New heaven and new earth. We have, you know, you know those just those small things that just make you so mad that in the long, like the big picture, they don't really matter, but in the moment, those, those idiosyncrasies that just make you so angry like the other day I was shutting my van door and I pressed the button and the car door went down like this and that reprobate baby seat came out and caught the door while I was already pressing the garage door to come down the door catches the baby carrier and comes up, back up, and the garage door just scrapes the back of my van into oblivion. <laughs> Little things like that will be no more. No more. But then there's more serious things. You see, you, you know, you look at things, you think to yourself, if that's the biggest problem I have, I'm doing pretty good because of the person that's struggling with cancer, the person that's going to chemotherapy, the person that, that's going to dialysis, the person that, that's struggling with COVID. All of those things will be no more. Can you imagine a land with no more pain, no more sorrow, no more death, none of it. It's all gone. A new heaven and a new earth. Fourthly, some people get excited when they see this. And I saw no temple therein, in verse 22. No temple therein. And they think to themselves, oh, there's no church in heaven? 
No, not really, because your entire existence is church. <laughs> your entire existence is being with the temple. Not being in a temple, but being with the temple, being with the tabernacle, which is who? It's not an it, it's a who. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. We will be with him. Side by side, do you remember God walking with Adam in the garden? There'll be nothing in between. We will be with him and we will be able to commune with him all day long. No absence, no chasm, no separation. We will be with the temple. That's why there is no temple. There's no need for mediation. There's no need for expiation. There's no need for sacrifices. There's no need for offering because we are with the Lord Jesus Christ and we are with him for all eternity. Amen. I've got to hurry. Number five, is this encouraging anyone? It's making me happy. No temple. Verse 23, there'll be no sun. You know why there will be no sun? It's because the glory of God will shine brighter than the sun in this new heaven and new earth. This is not a light that will ever go out. This is, this is absolute light. Yeah. This is absolute light. The light will never cease. You don't need a candle. You don't need a flashlight. You don't need batteries because the light of the Lamb of God will shine for all eternity. And just like there's no need for the sun, number six... There's no need for the moon. And if there is no sun and there is no moon and there is no day and there's no night, then there's no time. It's timeless. The evening and the morning were the first day. The evening and the morning were the second day, the third day, the fourth day. There is no evening, there is no morning, there is no sun, there is no moon. We are just there forever with our Lord. Amen. Number seven, there's no locks. Verse number 25, and the gates of it shall not be shut at all. By day. The gates are left wide open. Now let me ask you this. How many of you keep your door wide open all day long and all night long? None of you. If you do, you're a psychopath. <laughs> but in this place, there's no thieves. There's no robbers. There's no murder. There's nothing to be afraid of. There's nothing to be fearful of. And when do you usually shut the gate? It's usually at nighttime, right? And so there's no need for, for the gate. There's no need to shut it because in the end of verse 25, there shall be no night there. Can you imagine that? Now they just passed the... the, the uh, Daylight savings time bill, did you see that? Where they got rid of daylight savings time and it's, it's we're, we're here for forevermore. Um, if, it, if it passes through uh, the house, we, do, we never have to change our clocks again. I, some people, Rachel's really upset. She, she wishes that it would get night at, at 3 p.m. But I, I like for it to be uh, daylight to like 10 p.m. Um, but we don't have to worry about any of that because there's no night, no night because there's absolute light. Verse 27, look at what it says. Number nine, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life, there will be no sin in this place. No sin. 
None of it. No guilt of your sin. No sin at all. Nothing abominable. Nothing disgusting. Nothing corrupt. Nothing wicked. No sin at all can enter in into this place. Verse number 3 of chapter number 22. And there shall be no more curse. <laughs> there shall be no more curse. Not only is there no more sin, but there's no, no longer any effects of sin. There's no, there's no more death. There's no more of the curse. It's not hanging over us. We are in a curse-free world for the rest of eternity. No more curse. Now, I find it's something interesting. I'm, I'm wrapping up right now. I find something interesting that in the book of Genesis, what was started in Genesis finds its way completed here in the book of Revelation. For example, in Genesis, God created the heaven and the earth. In Revelation, God creates a new heaven and a new earth. In Genesis, God created the sun. In Revelation, there is no need of sun. In Genesis, God created the night. In Revelation, there is no need of night. In Genesis, God created the sea. In Revelation, there is no more sea. In Genesis, there entered a curse into the world. In Revelation, there is no more curse. In Genesis, death enters into the world. In Revelation, there's no more death. In Genesis, man is driven out of paradise. In Revelation, man is restored into paradise. In Genesis, sorrow and pain enters into the world. And in Revelation, there is no more pain and no more sorrow. God corrects everything that man destroyed in the book of Genesis here in Revelation. Now, there's two more things that are not in heaven. Number one. And they're, they're, this isn't exhaustive. They're, they're, there's many more things that aren't in heaven. But number 11, this one makes me really happy. Before we get to, to Revelation 21, Satan is loosed for a short season as we talked about before. And you know what happens? God grabs him and casts him into the lake of the fire with the false prophet and with the beast for all eternity. That accuser, that tempter, that one that was seeking about whom he may devour, he is no longer in your life. He is no longer going to threaten you. He will forever be cast into the lake of fire and you'll never have to worry about him again. Amen. Then lastly, this is where I wanted to end upon because this is, this is very sobering. After, after Satan gets thrown into the lake of fire for all eternity, there is a judgment, a great white throne judgment. And we are gathered around and we're going to see it. And this is the only one that upsets me. Because in this one, there's going to be an uncle, an aunt, a neighbor, a friend. They're going to stand before a holy God and there will be no excuse for them. And God is going to look at them and say to them, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. And he is going to cast them into the lake of fire. And I can't help but think that one of them catches my eye before they're cast into the lake of the fire and lake of fire. And they look at me and they scream, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you grab me by the legs, imploring me to get saved? Why didn't you do more to, to, to talk to me about the Lord Jesus Christ? And in that moment, tears are going to flood our eyes. 
Because we're going to see ones that we were able to reach but didn't. Be cast into the lake of fire for all eternity. That's a sobering thought. I think we could do more. I think we could do more. Let me ask you this. What in the world is stopping you? I know that you probably think in your mind right away, yeah, I, I have an uncle that's lost. I have a grandma that's lost. I have a grandpa that's lost. I have a father. I have a mother. I have a brother. I have a sister. I have a daughter. I have a son. They're lost. Let me ask you this. What in the world is stopping you from reaching them with the gospel? What is it? Pride? Laziness? Apathy? Whatever it is, there's no excuse for it. Especially with the technology that we have, that you can pick up a phone and you can call anyone. Anywhere in the world, you can get a hold of them. Internet, you can get a hold of them. Why are we not doing more? Because when we get to the new heaven and the new earth, the last group of people that I see that are not there are people that we truly love that are lost and on their way to hell. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I want you to think of somebody that you know of that's lost. And I want you to come up here and I want you to pray for them. I want you to come up here and I want you to pray that they get saved. And not only that, but I want you to pray that God would enable you, that God would strengthen you, that God would give you the boldness and courage that you need to reach them with the gospel. Dear Heavenly Father, would I pray that you bless this time? Would I pray that you help us to get after it? Would I thank you for what's in heaven? But Lord, I'm also thankful for what's not in heaven. And Lord, I pray that this message would just stir our hearts, that we would get after it. Lord, I pray that you help us. Bless this invitation now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.